Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for everyone joining the Breeder Fringe event for building a resilient British livestock industry. So we'll just give it a minute or two as people keep joining. Um, but thank you very much for everyone who's already joined and uh, making it make it on. So I believe everyone will be on mute. So don't worry about that. But if there is questions as we go through this, please do put it into the chat because uh, we've got a number of great speakers for you today to talk about the challenges that's happening in the livestock industry and some of the things we're actually seeing starting to happen on farms to look at new models for economic models on farm and, and how things are changing. So thank you very much for everyone joining. As I say, please do go into the chat and there's been some really interesting conversations and themes that have come out of this morning. And I think we'll see some of those continue on as we go through into this session, but really a, a focus on livestock, which is a big part of the British industry and something that you know we see changing dramatically, probably more so than every other agricultural sector over the next while. So with that, um, firstly, a, a big thank you to our speakers who are joining this. So uh, obviously myself, I'm the founder of Breeder. Breeder is an agricultural data technology um, and trading platform. Claire, who's the Regenerative Agriculture Director at FAI Farms, and she'll introduce herself shortly. Phil Stocker, Chief Executive of the National Sheep Association, uh, which I believe many of you will know, and then Phil Bicknell, who's recently changed roles away from AHTB, but is now business development at SEA, which is the Centre of Innovation Excellence at Livestock. So thank you all for uh, joining me today. And as we go through, we'll introduce, everyone will do sort of five minutes, uh, 10 minute little presentation or discussion, and please do raise questions as they go through. Uh, and then we'll answer those questions as we go, and we'll have a roundup of more questions at the end, if anyone has any more as we go through. So firstly, just to kick off from a breeder perspective, um, what we're seeing and, and the reason for having this conversation and really wanting to bring this discussion to the fore is that the livestock industry, more unlike any other industry in the UK, is really under significant amount of pressure over the next five to 10 years. We're seeing tra changing trading environments. With that comes competitiveness, whether that's on the price of beef, whether that's on the quality of lamb, what we're doing for exporting lamb to Europe. I see that we've now got opportunities now coming back to the US, which is exciting. But how do we remain competitive in a growing international market with new trade deals that are coming? Obviously the big topic of a lot of the morning subjects have been around environment, net zero. How do we support farmers with reaching this? How do we offset those targets for the farmers who are producing beef and need to reduce methane and other types of uh, environmental gases? We also see big changing economic models, whether it's the removal of basic payment schemes. We're also seeing a changing generation and we are seeing bigger and bigger farms that are starting to consolidate. Um, and what is likely to happen with new ELM schemes and some of the rumors coming out of Westminster at the moment about what impact that may have on smaller farmers over the next while and how we keep smaller farmers, which are a core part of the, the British farming infrastructure, economic economical over the next while and therefore being able to do a lot of the change we're doing. And finally, we're seeing rapid adoption of innovation and technology, whether it's around environmental measurement, whether it's about performance on farm genetics, we're seeing huge changes and, and COVID has been a big driver of this as well in terms of the cost of say genomic assessment of animals in the livestock sector and how that can improve productivity, reduce environmental impact. And then we're seeing other innovations such as food additives and that come into this sector. And I think all of these things together mean that unlike any other sector that's happening within the farming, the livestock sector is something that really is going to have to go through change. And, and with that comes a need for adoption mindset change that happens with farms. So what we're seeing is a really this sort of change to a new supply chain. And with Breeder, that's oh, apologies about the unfolding. And with livestock, that really is quite different. So environmental tracking has been a big part of what is now having to be part of this livestock sector. That's made even more challenging. A lot of the tools that are out there assess individual farms, but animals don't stay on individual farms through their life cycle. So how are we assessing animals as they move between farms and to get to a kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of meat is even more challenged by that tracking animals through the supply chain. Uh, genomic improvement, we've seen things in Ireland like ICBF and the impact that can have on productivity. 
Uh, even on individual farms, we're seeing growing integrated supply chains with selected genetics that are growing uh, in those in those supply chains. Big one, which I know AHDB has been focused on, but everyone, including CL, with and Phil, will be able to comment on this later in terms of how we support uh, technology adoption with our average age of farmer close to sixty. We do have to support them in new technology that's coming through. Uh, we've got things like LIP, which are likely to come in as well. Um, and even more challenges in terms of how we then, you know, with new technologies, which haven't been the skill set of every farmer in the past to educate and improve. And then finally, when we start looking at meat quality, uh, we are moving into a world where we're competing with the New Zealands, the Australias, the Americas, as we start to look at other trade deals, it's no longer just about being productive, uh, having the highest welfare standards, but we're also going to be competing for the consumer's taste and meat quality becomes a big part of that in terms of how we have to think about the new supply chains in the future. However, we've got a number of strengths and I'd be really interested to hear from our speakers today. So the UK brand name is a very strong name for produce. Uh, we've got world leading research institutions. We have a big strength in dairy beef. There's no other sort of industry um, globally or country globally that actually has such a strong dairy beef. And we've got lamb production where we've got a huge amount of expertise and export to Europe um, that we've got to be able to continue and hopefully extend to other markets as we go through. Our ability to grow grass, we all know about, and also the fact that we have individual animal data and we've got really high welfare standards is a huge positive. They had a huge amount of red tape at times, but at the same time, there are a huge amount of data and information there and quality of produce there that we're able to expand on. So at Breeder, we really are looking about how we build these future supply chains, but really putting farmers at the heart of that. Um, very simply, we help build farm livestock management tools that manage animal data. We help the farmer with understanding what supply they've got and what impact those animals are having on farm. And then we do help with them farmers selling animals with data. You sell a car with a service history. We're helping build out animals which build lifetime data as they go through. And then finally, what's sort of really exciting for us is using that data farmers, we now have a multi-million dollar fund to actually release cash flow on animals as they grow. So as farmers capture data on their animals, they can smooth out cash flow for animals that maybe have been 24 months to grow, they can start to get cash flow to grow their own businesses as they progress. We now have a national network over a thousand farmers uh, in the UK that are using us and we're starting to have a real impact on individual farms, whether it's driving profitability and all sustainability starts with commercial sustainability, uh, whether it's sourcing animals in a better way with data that are gonna grow on their farm um, or using the genetic information that they produce on their farms to improve their own profitability per animal. And I think the other side of that is, you know, through using data, this is a big opportunity to, to uh, actually improve the productivity of our farms. We're able to reduce the age to slaughter of cattle uh, through in measure, purely just by measurement, and that's through making measurement easy. And overall, this has a huge impact on reducing uh, carbon. And I think the nice thing about some of the opportunities ahead of this is if we can improve the productivity on farm, it improves, improves the profitability, improves holding capacity, uh, but at the same time, it improves eating quality and it reduces carbon. So I think there's this big opportunity for us to be able to reach these targets. And our top 20% of farmers, when we compare to the national average, are already hitting the target set by IPCC close to 28% less carbon through when you look at some of the data that they're producing on age to slaughter. However, it's not going to be easy. And I think the thing for us is there's been a lot of learning. Breeders now three and a half years old. And there's a few things we need to actually try and change and support the way farmers are working and how they're addressing these needs. And firstly, we've got to put farmers at the heart of this supply chain. And that means we need tools that are really easy for farmers to use, but they're actually providing insights to the farmer, not just to the supply chain. There has been a history of data being collected that goes to the supply chain, but not necessarily providing that action to the farmer. To do this, actually, we need to work with everyone on the farm. It, use, it needs to be usable uh, through everyone on the farm. 60% of our farmers are coming from pen and paper. Uh, most of those are, you know, not used phone apps for farm management before. And so therefore, it's got to work from everyone, from the farm worker through to the grandparent who may be looking at those farm and animals and looking after them day to day. 
The next bit is collaboration. You know, we are one of the solutions. You've heard from another of a number of those other solutions during the day today. How we collaborate up and down the supply chain, how we integrate data along that supply chain is going to be very critical to providing that value back to the farmer. And then finally, you know, people matter, and we need to support everyone in the UK with a learning mindset and providing the right data at the right time. And, and we really are now seeing that, you know, farmers are embracing the change that's starting to come through. And I think it is quite exciting and, and that's going to open up a number of opportunities. However, it comes with its challenges, um, but we do see that Brand UK has a huge potential moving forward. So thank you for that. And um, we'll go on to our first speaker, um, if there is any questions to me later on, I, I'm more than happy to answer those, but we'll go on to our first speaker, who is Claire. Claire is doing some very exciting work at FAI around regenerative agriculture. And yeah, it's going to fill us in on some of the stuff they've been doing over the last 12 months. So Claire, over to you. Thanks ever so much, Ian. Um, yeah, go straight to the first slide. We'll hit the ground running and just talk about why, why we're interested in regenerative agriculture and why we're interested in change, as Ian's just highlighted. We know that change is needed. Um, Johan Rockstrom, who is the scientist behind um, the planetary boundaries work, um, which has been looking at the planetary boundaries that which we've crossed, um, which has helped provide the proof for the climate crisis for governments accepting or um, declaring that we have a climate crisis. And these are his words. What we do between 2030, sorry, what we do between 2020 and 2030, from the evidence we have today, will be the decisive decade for humanity. A bit of a change here or there or a tweak to something, we have to do something fundamentally different. Um, to protect our planet. What's interesting, you can see the red um, lines that are showing the planetary boundaries that we've crossed. It's firstly to say that this work is actually only up until 2009. We know that this has just exacerbated since then. Um, and we all um, focus on climate and talk about that, but actually the biodiversity loss and, and nitrogen cycle is something that is out of kilter. Um, and a big contribution of that, of course, comes from agriculture. So. Although this slide can be quite dramatic, it's actually how exciting to be part of the reversal of, um, of, of fixing some of the planetary boundaries that we've crossed and getting things back in line. Um, for those that, um, sorry, I just should say also, for those that don't know, FAI, um, in brief, we are um, a consultancy organisation. We work with large food brands um, on improving the sustainability and traceability in their supply chains, um, focused on animal welfare, sustainability as was, and increasing human generation um, across the UK in our base, we have reach um, across the world. And central, central to that, if you go to the next slide, Ian, is our farm in Oxford, we're 1200 acres um, of farmland, mostly grazing um, on floodplain that you can see owned by Oxford University, but on a standard farm business tenancy um, in a classic um, tenant tenant sorry landlord um relationship and what's exciting about the farm is that it gives us a chance to kind of experiment with things and, and practice what we preach it is a commercial farm i should say and um, so we do we do get um funding for projects that we run when we're doing the research but it doesn't fund the farm so we have to kind of make things stand up like everybody else so the previous slide showed the big picture of why, why we're doing this, and this is to show why we're doing it just for here as on, on our farm, in that we used to describe ourselves as a farm that was wet in winter and dry in summer. Um, and then when we look at these photos, we start to see the extremes of what that means these days. We face severe flooding and drought almost every year. Um, and so climate change and the changes that are happening are hitting us right here and now and our productivity um, and our environmental footprint is affected by that. So we needed to look for a different way of doing things. If you move to the next slide. Thanks Ian. Um, and we talk all about sustainability. It's the word of the word of the decade really or of the previous decade. Um, and what we, when we first started talking about regenerative, then the, the thing that people say is, well, it's just another version of sustainable. It's the same thing, but a new word. What we really like about this, um, this, this picture here is it kind of really shows what the difference is. And in reality, have anybody, well, not anybody, as an industry, we've not achieved sustainability yet. If we say that sustainability is about net zero, carbon neutral, we know that although there are individual examples of farms or businesses that are doing that, 
often that is achieved in the main by offsetting. We haven't actually achieved a kind of carbon neutrality or impact neutrality um, ourselves um, before we start thinking about selling out. So we're, we're an organic farm here and often people ask me, where do I see that we sit on that on that line? And it, and it is really kind of at the bottom of nature friendly. Um, we are now doing a lot more regenerative agriculture, so we're heading in a better direction, but just doing our current carbon footprint for this year with Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit will show that we're still um, we're still an emitting organisation and we haven't we haven't reached neutrality yet so we have a long way to go um, so th this but, but but one opportunity I think it's not all bad I think um, what's it 40 percent of the UK approximately is down to permanent pasture and even just with that amount of land with a tweak to our grazing system that I'll come on to in the next slide please Ian um, we can make a really big impact so what have we done differently or what are we doing differently? We have changed our grazing over from set stop grazing. We spent a couple of years doing some rotational or mob grazing, precision grazing, techno grazing, however we want to phrase it. Um, and then we've moved on to um, full on regenerative, adaptive multi paddock, holistic planned grazing would be some of the titles that it's given. Um, the difference between those Two things. I think we know what set stock grazing is, but the difference between the rotational grazing versus the regenerative, I would say, is the focus on rest period. When we're focusing on rotational grazing, we're looking at utilisation. When we were doing that, we grew a lot more grass, I have to say. When we moved from set stock to rotational, it was brilliant. We grew loads more grass and we then had to up our livestock to deal with it. And then we had to figure out what we were going to do with our animals in the winter because we didn't have that grass during the winter and that's when our sticking point came because it meant us putting up new sheds and on a on, on a tenancy as i've mentioned um with landlord not that interested in um much investment here um it was a difficult one to see that the answer to becoming more sustainable by having more animals on this farm but without increasing our inputs was to put up more sheds requiring more concrete it's like more concrete cannot be the answer so that's why we um looked at regenerative grazing and we we, we moved onto that which now provides us with all year round grazing um, and the main difference being um, the main difference being is a focus on rest rather than utilization rest is the most powerful tool we have in a grazing system but we I certainly didn't know that until I'd started doing this a couple of years ago um, but our inputs have come down our outputs gone up with Ian mentioned about better daily live weight gains. We're now starting to finish 18 months. Everything will be done by 24, but we see huge potential as we build on this system year on year to improve that. Um, and that compares to back when we were housing and using grain as part of our finishing ration, we were not starting to finish until about 20 months, 24 months and going right through until way over 36 months. So um, we've seen a, a big productivity increase, um, as well as all the environmental benefits and better carbon sequestration, biodiversity, et cetera, that we need to see. Next slide, please. And uh, I just wanted to share this because I took these photos the other day because we've, the, the thing that have changed, um, I think the thing that I describe as what we've changed the most previous to that slide, we've changed our grazing management. We still farm the same land with the same animals. The thing that's changed the most is the way we think about grazing and the way we think about managing our land and the way we think about our whole farm approach, really. Um, if you had said to me five years ago, you should be out wintering on this farm, I would have agreed with everyone else that it was absolutely impossible. It could never be done. And, and that was backed up by everybody I ever spoke to about it. Because I think we imagine out wintering being like the picture on the left, which I took uh, when I took my mother in law home on New Year's Day, um, which is a common, I think, certainly around here, out wintering uh, system. And you can see, obviously, that some of the concerns with that, not less that we talk about carbon and bare soil emits carbon straight away before we even go into any of the other concerns we might have about that picture. And I also took the same picture on the right hand side I took that picture of our cows on New Year's Day that's all of our cows and calves together in one cell um, on New Year's Day and we don't have loads of grass and it's definitely still wet underfoot but we don't have the damage um, the damage that you see there you could say that that's all very well and good but what does it look like after you've grazed it for a few days so I just wanted to share this picture to say that that's what it looks like so we do have um 
We do have some bare earth patches, which is where we've rolled out the hay bales. Um, so we don't have enough grass grown to be able to um, feed feed cows, but we are um, sort of supplementing that with hay. Um, but what's great is that everything's doing really well um, from it. We're not having to supplement with anything else. So we're a pasture for life certified farm now. So we use no grain whatsoever in our breeding or finishing, um, which is partly down to management of our grazing and partly down to a, 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 a tweak in genetics, I think. But the grazing and the management of that has been an absolutely um, an absolute key key part. Next slide, please, Ian. Oh, yeah, go back one, actually. I've got one more point to make. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons why um, all this is so important, not only for our own resilience, you know, resilience is such a key word everyone's using, but so important because um, we're all feeling a bit of a lack of it at, at times. And working with um, the food brands that we do, McDonald's, Marks and Spencer, Ikea, et cetera, you know, what we know is that often 75 to 90% of their um, scope three emissions are coming from us, from farmers. Um, and when they need, they need, they are under increasing pressure to make big changes in their business. And that's only coming down one way. So we have to uh, take every opportunity we can to try and um, figure out ways to, to, to make those changes that are needed. And it won't be one thing, uh, it'll be a combination of all of the things that we'll talk about today over both conferences and ongoing. Um, the, the, the one kind of singular solution world that we had where it was like want to grow more put on this amount of fertilizer get more output perfect sorted you know, that that doesn't work nature is complex we need to work more with nature um, and in doing that it, it, it's, it's not a one size fits all which is actually great for farmers because we all know one one no farm is the same and to ian's point about putting farmers back at the heart of food production that's one thing that really excites me about regenerative agriculture next slide i'm nearly done so we use this question quite a lot when we're working with groups. This is one that came from working with a group of UK um, farm advisors. What do we think are the biggest barriers to the uptake of regenerative farming? Understanding, fear of change, tradition, viability, lack of knowledge. Those are the things, the key words that come out. Whatever we pose this question, we get really similar answers. Interestingly, the financial bit, it ebbs and flows with how strongly the financial side of things comes through. Um, but certainly this not really knowing what to do next um, element is something that, um, and, and not wanting to change. We're all in humans, we all don't like change really. Um, and, and, and we're often um, take trepidation with it. Um, but uh, I think the difference between when we first started asking this question to now, in fact, even in just 12 months is, is, is changing. But these are the barriers that, we, that, we're, that we're facing to, to get change. And so what we need to start doing, I think is, um, starting to share or learn and um, pay for knowledge. We, we need, instead of things and products, what we need is, is, is knowledge, um, understanding, more information, more data at our fingertips to be able to make better decisions. Um, and that requires a change in the way we think about our systems. Next slide. Ah, and of course, for anybody wanting to learn more about regenerative agriculture, we have a course. So just a little plug here, but we've got um, a lot more information about what we're doing on Regen um, and what others are doing within, within our network and the companies that we're working with. So if you're interested in anything more about regenerative agriculture as part of the solution, please get in touch. Thanks, Claire. Um, very much appreciate that. A few comments have come through in the chat, uh, definitely in terms of um, holistic management, but also pasture quality. And I think it's all very impressive in terms of the direction you've taken it. And having been up there a few times and doing the stuff we're doing on sort of dairy beef versus suckler, I think that's very, very exciting in terms of where it's going. So, um, but yeah, looking looking forward to seeing how it progresses if there's any questions for claire as we go through uh on regen how you get into it i think she's answered most of them as we go through but we will have some other things at the end so well, one lucky question came in in time so claire um sounds too good to be true shorten the finishing time we're moving away from high protein feeds what's the secret um and uh, a change in perspective on what's important. So we don't have a tidy farm anymore. It looks a mess. There's weeds everywhere. Uh, a recognition that we need to play our part in doing more than just producing volume. 
So we did, for example, reduce our sheep flock in order to um, a, a, in order for us to get the rest periods ahead of time. We're now building building back up um, our numbers. We're doing that via cattle. So we replaced our sheep flock with um, dairy crosses in order to working with Ian to work out um, you know how we, we we we've we've seen it works well on sucklers. How does it work on dairy crosses? What are the barriers? What are the differences? We know they have a different start in life, so we need to understand more about that. It sounds too good to be true. It's, um, yeah, in a, in a way, it feels like it is. It's definitely not easy because it takes some changes in the way that you manage things and people are quite often quite um, not so sure about it and quite critical. But that's that's what we're seeing. We're, we're part of, a, I should say, we're part of a McDonald's funded project to look at this. So this style of grazing, can it work at scale in the UK? We know there were smaller examples of it happening, but could it happen on a large farm doing commercial style of farming? Um, and that project runs from 2020 to 2024. So we've only just come to the end of the second year to have any data to really start to compare and look at. So that will be becoming published um, over the coming years to actually show what our transition looked like. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's, 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 going, um, it's going in the right direction and it is looking it is looking good. I should say that our move away from grain started, uh, we are organic, so we've always been a high proportion of forage in the diet, um, but that, that journey started a bit longer ago when we decided we wanted to reduce the amount of grain in the diet before we started, um, before we started. So it's not like we've suddenly gone in one year and just cut out grain completely. That's been a transitional thing, uh, making yeah. changes each year. And it's, and it's interesting, just to add to that, Claire, what we see with some of the data coming through is there is definite genetics that work on this sort of system versus mm -hmm. genetics that don't so i think you know that sort of extensive grazing you have specific breeds and really sires within breeds that are doing a good job when you look at the data that's coming through so i think there's a number of those things i know you've done um over time which doesn't happen overnight as well so that's right very good um so We'll come back to a few other questions later on, but uh, next one, just to make sure we get everyone through everyone, but uh, Phil, um, Chief Executive of National Sheep Association. So uh, very pleased to have you and, and thank you very much for joining and sharing your thoughts, given how turbulent or non-turbulent, as we may have not expected, the sheep industry has been over the last 12 months. So. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, just to say that I'm really pleased uh, to be involved. And thank you, Ian and Breeder, for um, sponsoring and organising this event and uh, and inviting me to be part of it as well. Um, the Oxford Farming Conference for a, a long time has been all about um, opening eyes and looking to the future of farming and food production. And it's absolutely right that our sheep farming sector, and I am going to be talking specifically about sheep because uh, that's where I come from, I guess. Um, but it's absolutely right that our sheep farming industry explores um, different approaches and uses technology that is going to help us um, realize some of the opportunities that lie ahead of us. So move on, please. So, um, you know, sheep farming, like all of agriculture, no different to any other part of agriculture, I guess, is going through massive change just at the moment, um, both here in the UK and globally as well. And it's right for us to consider, um, you know, a, a well used saying um, uh, to act locally. Uh, but think globally. Um, and I would argue that it is individual farmers um, we're best placed to have the biggest impact for ourselves uh, by affecting things locally, i.e. On, on our farms and through our own marketing activities. But it's also right that an eye is kept on uh, national and global conditions and that we're aware of what's going on outside the farm gate as well. Um, we made a fairly uh, monumental decision um, three or four years ago that uh, uh, came to a, a climax at the end of 2020 when we left the European Union. Um, you know, having been part of um, the European Union and that trading bloc for uh, close on 50 years, um, we have taken a decision to become an independent nation um, that has got massive trade implications for us when you consider the way that we traded our our sheep products um, you know, over the last few decades. Um, our aspirations now are about striving out uh, and being global uh, players in, um, in trade. Uh, in some areas, that's going to bring opportunities for us, and in some areas, it's going to bring some big threats. And uh, you know, the Australian deal that was signed off just before Christmas, still got to go through 
um, the Commons and still got to go through the Trade and Agriculture Commission as well. But you know, some of those sorts of deals will be, bring threats as well as uh, as opportunities. But you know, for the first time for a long, long time, um, we're now an independent nation, um, and it will have implications on our on our future markets. Um, but our government at that time, and for a long time prior to our departure from the European Union as well, um, was very much behind the reform of the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, and it's been pushing for uh, and two main things that it's now got the opportunity to try to realize. One of those is for agriculture to increase our productivity. And uh, in saying that uh, increasing our productivity, what, what, what the government would like to see is uh, a, an industry that is uh, non-reliant less reliant or non-reliant on support and, and subsidy. I would argue that that's something that we would all want to see as well, to be honest, but um, it's a challenge that is being uh, placed on our shoulders now to increase our productivity. And I'll come back to that just in a moment. Uh, but to do that as alongside uh, protecting and further improving our environment and our environment in the widest sense. And uh, you know, it wouldn't be a surprise to anyone uh, just how carbon and, and climate change has raised up the agenda in the, in the, in the last few years. And I would include that um, within that, uh, that that phrase of improving our environment, it is about improving our our, our carbon footprint, um, our uh, um, contribution to our mitigation of of, of climate change, but also um, our natural environment, our contribution to rebuilding nature, and uh, our environment as well is taken to include animal welfare now as well. So move on, please. Um, so, but, but but while we're going through massive changes uh, on sheep farmers, uh, uh, you know, on sheep farms, I guess it is the case that um, um, that uh, much of this might not be being felt just at the moment. We're only at the very start of um, the the reduction of basic payment on, on on our farms, and you know, I'm told by Defra that uh, only some forty percent of um, sheep farmers uh, actually have BPS entitlement. So whilst we're seen as an industry that is heavily reliant, and we are in some ways on, uh, on policy support, policy money, um, you know, there's a large proportion of our industry that, uh, that, that is not. Um, but if you look at um, the last 12 month sheep prices and how they've uh, been well ahead of the, the last five year average, um, you know, there's many farmers out there at the moment that are thinking that, um, you know, this is going to be the answer to our, our, our problems and that, um, you know, maybe we're, we're going to be able to be less reliant on, on policy support, BPS and agri-environment schemes in the future. Um, you, you know, the, those high uh, finished land prices have um, also uh, fed into high store land prices and breeding stock prices as well. And at the moment, there's a lot of buoyancy uh, within our, our industry. And you could ask, for many farmers will be asking the question, you know, what are we concerned about when we're seeing some really positive uh, global signals about um, uh, food demand, food security um, in our industry, you know, the, the supply and demand dynamics globally are in, in a very positive state at the moment. Many farmers will be asking about what we're concerned about, but uh, if you can move on in. Um, but sheep prices are only one part of a, a very uh, complicated puzzle. Um, we're seeing um, infla uh, input inflation, uh, this has been mentioned already, but the, the cost of uh, feed, fertilizer, fuels, energy, uh, fencing materials, building materials, um, you know, all of these costs are going through the roof at the end of a year where we've seen really buoyant um, sheep prices. This should really focus the mind on making sure that the investments that are being made are being made in areas where they really pay. Um, we're seeing trade flows that are changing um, uh, before our eyes, um, bringing threats, as I've already mentioned, in the case of New Zealand and Australia. Uh, but real opportunities in the case of Asia and the US as well, that's signing off of, uh, of um, the, um, the, with the USDA, the removal of the small ruminant rule just before Christmas means that we have now got real potential of access into the US and we're expecting to see some movement there um, probably by, uh, by Easter time. But that old order of 96% of our exports, sheep meat exports going into the EU are changing and just quite where they'll settle out um, in, in the future is uh, anyone's guess, and it's not just clear. Uh, it's worth saying that last year in 2021, we saw UK sheep meat exports to the EU drop by nearly 25%. So that's almost a quarter less uh, of, of our sheep meat exports went to the European Union. Although very interestingly, the value of those exports only fell by uh, some 3.5%. 
So again, we're seeing uh, declined volumes, but increased uh, values. Um, so we've, we've got that US market, which is the with access, which is pending um, over uh, the last two years, really, uh, because of the uncertainty around Brexit and more recently COVID, New Zealand has stayed out of the UK market and similarly with, um, with Australia as well. But we've got both of those uh, deals impending now, pending now, and, uh, I, I, you know, it does bring some uncertainty. But um, our domestic market has really benefited over that period of time and the closure of our hospitality markets really exposed the fact that a lot of Australian lamb was coming into um, hospitality supply chains. And of course, if people can't eat out of home, they eat in home and they turn to buying their, their products, their meat from our supermarkets and our high street butchers and, and, and farm shops. And it became clear um, some 18 months ago that those sorts of outlets are much more loyal to UK supply chains um, than the hospitality um, supply chains largely uh, which uh, are, are, are delivered to customers out of sight. Um, so, you know, there was a period, we've been through a period where our domestic um, market has really benefited from stronger demand and reduced uh, imports from uh, both Australia and more significantly New Zealand. Um, you know, we've seen huge supply chain disruptions uh, which in shipping, transport, processing, export health certificates, um, but some of the disruption we've re really seen over this last uh, six months or more, and particularly in the pig and the poultry industry and the dairy and the fresh produce industry as well, you know, we're, we're, I would argue that the sheep sector is showing more resilience. And I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a few moments, really. But um, so there's a lot there around uh, trade and, uh, and markets. But um, of course, um, the, uh, the policy arena is, is changing enormously as well, and climate change and nature recovery have become uh, major uh, policy influences. Um, we've still got our work cut out, I think, to convince the government of the importance of British food production being the mainstay of food security. Um, and we are seeing a contradiction between driving our standards higher and wanting to be world leaders in environmental and animal welfare practices, and also at the same time liberalizing global trade and, um, and, and trying to maintain high standards on our retail space as well as uh, on, on our farms. So if you could move on, Ian, please. So there couldn't be a more interesting or exciting or uncertain time to be farming, but um, for uh, whichever way you look at it really, for reasons of profitability or carbon footprint or resource efficiency, any other desirable aspiration that we might have is worth considering uh, the need and the opportunity to improve the productivity levels of our of our sheep farms. Um, alongside ELMS and the animal health and welfare pathway, the other ambition of the government is to improve farming enterprise product productivity. I've mentioned that already. And really, it's an unfortunate term because um, it's an unfortunate use of the word productivity, I think, because most people view productivity about uh, around increasing production levels, but it's not about that at all. Productivity is a me measure of profitability. Um, again, with the government having that overarching aim of uh, farms being less reliant on, on, on support. And profitability is simply the margin left after the cost of inputs and the value of the outputs. And there's very many, there's many ways that uh, different farms can go about this, depending on the resources and their approaches and their aspirations for the future. You know, for some, it will be about adding value. To others, it'll be about reducing costs. For some, it'll be about actually trying to increase the, uh, the, the output. Uh, some of our farms will choose to go do, down, more down the commodity production road, where others will choose to go down the speciality, high provenance, high value, added value uh, route as well. And there is room for all of those approaches as long as farms know where they're going and understand uh, what they're doing. But um, there's no doubt that in the future, uh, achieving profitability will be more about making sure that we ensure the investments that we make on our farms actually do yield a result and they pay for themselves. Okay, move on again. Um, so um, if productivity is a measure of profitability, there are a number of, of different ways of achieving this, but wh whichever route you choose, uh, there's only one way to start really, and that's by understanding and knowing your business. It is about record keeping and using basic data to make truly informed decisions. We do know that um, on average, many grazing livestock farms are heavily reliant on BPS, agri-environment and diversified income. Um, and it's often it's often the case that livestock enterprises themselves are are covering their costs, uh, as is shown in those um, 
two examples there within that uh, that red box. Quite often, the livestock enterprises uh, are just uh, you know, co covering their costs and income and profit is coming from those other activities. Move on, Ian. But we also know that when we consider averages, there are really significant variables uh, between the top and the bottom, uh, bottom performing enterprises. And this slide relates to LFA grazing livestock, but it would be just as relevant in non-LFA areas too. It shows that with very similar costs, the output of the top performance is a, performers is around 60% higher than the bottom performers. It shows that those top performers are prepared to spend on variable costs, feed and vet and med uh, inputs, for example. And that their overheads and general farming costs, labor, machinery, are more under control. So it does show that within those averages, there is the scope for those top performers to be uh, profitable and, uh, and successful in the future. Uh, move on to my final slide. Um, and here I'd just like to out, outline, uh, finish by outlining what I see as a natural capital of our industry and something that gives us real resilience and a, a set of outcomes that are worth protecting. Um, and I believe give us a level of resilience as a really good starting point for some of the, the changes and the, and the, and the further uh, advances that we need to make in our industry. Our challenges around increasing our productivity without losing uh, what I see as such a strong foundation and image and reputation. It's worth just noting that we've got somewhere in the region of 45,000 uh, family scale uh, farms that give us a lot of independence, resilience, and still give us a, um, a chance to provide that first foot on the farming ladder for many youngsters coming into agriculture. We're seen as being culturally, socially, and ecologically rich. Uh, we've got a huge level of diversity for a long time within the sheep industry. Some of that genetic diversity has been seen as a, an embarrassment, a bit of a nuisance. I believe that it's time to look at that genetic diversity as an asset now without um, taking our eye off the ball of needing to make genetic advances and improvements across all of our breeds. But that diversity now, diversity is seen as a strength in many, many areas of, uh, of, of life and society. We're farming our sheep mainly in semi-natural conditions. Again, something that's seen as being a very positive thing for welfare and the foundations of uh, good welfare on farms. Um, the way that we're managing our grassland, whether it's um, short rotation lays um, within arable systems, um, whether it's uh, multi-species lays, whether it's permanent pastures, we are involved with that uh, practice of building organic matter, uh, improving soil quality and sequestering carbon in soils. We are at large uh, living alongside wildlife and many of our grazed environments are seen as being really valuable wildlife habitats um, for ground nesting birds and invertebrates and pollinators. Again, there's a lot more we can do and it's interesting to see some of the regenerative farming activities that Claire outlined alongside, but we've got a good foundation of farming alongside wildlife. We're producing some of the, the healthiest and most nutritious of food that you can imagine, mainly from, uh, from grass. And we're also, although you wouldn't know it when you get your wool check at the end of the year or twice of the year, but we are producing the most sustainable fiber in the world. And there will become a time when that is recognized in the markets, I'm sure. And overall in this world of um, renewable technology, um, given that most of our uh, sheep and graze livestock are produced from grass that increasingly is uh, grown with little more than uh, rainfall, soil nutrients and sunshine, uh, with that, uh, with our flocks replenishing themselves on an annual basis, um, you know, we are ultimate, almost the ultimate in renewable technology. And I would argue that with all the changes that we've got ahead of us, uh, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Thanks, Ian. Apologies. Thank you very much for that, Phil. Uh, but dealing with the mute button wouldn't be a conference without that. So, um, but so very, very interesting to see the challenges. I suppose the sheep industry has almost been through some of the international export challenges. When you look at the sort of two different markets that um, have been key, being export and also uh, British supermarkets and, and the willingness for them to support um, British and UK food. What do you see as some of the challenges around both of those areas moving forward? And, and what are some of the things we think we have to change to make sure we stay relevant for both the supermarkets, but also sort of growing relevance for US and other international markets? Mm. It's a really important question. And I, I think, uh, again, there's a lot we need to learn uh, still about what is the ideal balance between our domestic market, and the value of export markets. Um, you, you know, for the past number of years, 
um, sheep meat, um, our sheep meat trade patterns have been such that we've had around 65% of our production um, sold into our de domestic market. And I, I would argue that's a really strong starting point and something that we need to maintain. We know that whenever there's any disruption in our marketplace, be that through foot and mouth um, outbreaks or through any political unrest anywhere, uh, any any supply chain disruption, we know that it's our domestic market that we always fall back on. It may not always be the most valuable, but it probably is the most stable and secure and resilient. So, uh, resilient. And I think, as an industry, we be, should be setting ourselves a target. And I'm not arguing. I'm not going to suggest where that target should be, but I think we should set a target for uh, where we'd like to see. Um, that uh, that domestic market fit within our production. But there's also absolutely no doubt that our export um, trade uh, really helps to drive competition, drive value, and it helps us to place um, uh, carcass parts, if you like, um, into uh, 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 markets across the world that add value. And there's two ways of doing that. You know, one way will be around um, high value premium products into some of these newly emerging US markets. Um, and there's also a real value in um, continuing to develop markets for fifth quarter products, products that we would not dream of eating here in the, in the UK into China and other parts of Asia. And it is about trying to maximize or optimize the value of that car uh, the, the carcass by working closely with processors to place products into markets where they achieve most value. Um, and I think it, in coming back to our domestic market, it's going to be about making sure that all of our supply chains remain loyal and show a little bit more loyalty to Br uh, British production. I think we should be looking at home first, but also looking at our export markets to uh, add value, drive competition and, and enable our industry to do what we do really, really well, which is grow good grass, uh, produce good quality lamb and work with our processors to place products in markets around the world. Perfect. Phil, thank you very much for your time and really appreciate having you on today. And I, I think the, the interest in seeing that top versus middle and bottom performers. I mean, we often see with being technology company and data capture that just measurement is often the first step and we see huge gains in that. So I think that's quite exciting um, and, you know, huge opportunity there for the majority of farmers. So last but not least, but uh, Phil, thank you, Phil Bicknell and <laughs> moving on. Um, exciting to hear what you're up to in the new role and, and thank you for joining and, and looking forward to sort of hearing on sort of the challenges that, that you're up to and, and some of the things that you're looking to address. Thanks, Ian, uh, and uh, many thanks for the invite. Um, look, I'm going to touch on a, a couple of things that um, that both Claire and, and Phil touched on um, and uh, wrap in with some of the things we're doing at CL. Um, and look, the start of the year is always a time for looking into the, the crystal ball. Um, and I think that's a challenge at the best of times, but despite where we've been in terms of, uh, in terms of prices for both beef and for sheep, um, there's so much uncertainty in the world. And when we're talking about complex supply chains and a world where ambiguity feels like the norm, well, sometimes we, we think about that as a, as a reason for not making change and maybe sitting tight and riding things out. Um, for me though, there's three key drivers that just mean that that isn't an option. Um, we know there's going to be increased competition from uh, from trade deals and further trade liberalisation. Yes, that creates opportunities. For me, feels like there's some pretty big threats on the horizon for us. Um, we know livestock producers are going to be operating in a market where there's no subsidy. Payments available are going to be for environmental actions. And that direction of travel has been set for a while. Uh, and I think it was back at Oxford in 2018 when Michael Gove first used that mantra of public money for public goods. And linked to that, the sustainability expectations of our sector are gonna ramp up over the next decade. I'm not sure it's necessarily consumers and shoppers that are leading the charge on this one, but it's certainly high on the agenda for policymakers and for big businesses alike. We shouldn't really be in any doubt that today's high standards are effectively tomorrow's baseline. So what's needed, and look, I come at this from a, from a sustainability angle, not least because it's been a key theme of what we've been doing at uh, CL for the last couple of years. And I think net zero in particular is the thread that um, probably joins together some priority areas for us at CL. Things around animal health, around nutrition, around resource efficiency. And when I speak to some of the researchers across the academic institutions within the CL network, there's a definite carbon focus and net zero focus right now to where the investment and where the funding is being targeted in terms of research and development. Now, we've previously looked at net zero carbon and UK livestock to try and outline the science, highlight the emission hotspots, uh, provide benchmarks. 
Uh, and we've done all of that at a sector level and an industry level. What we're now aiming to do is to drill down into the actions that could be implemented on farm. So what we're doing, we're taking a sector by sector approach uh, that looks at different actions and mitigations that, uh, that farm businesses can take. And we look at those across different themes uh, and we're assessing those against a range of criteria. I'm really, uh, really kind of struck by some of the stuff that Claire said in terms of the, the solutions that they're working through and experimenting and trying different options. I don't think there's a set roadmap for farm businesses when it comes to net zero, but different businesses will have different options and different opportunities. Um, one of the things that jumps out for me, and it, it touches on the, the thing that Phil said around productivity, is actually there's such an obvious fit here with improving, um, improving sustainability with improving productivity and profitability as well. And it's so much more nuanced than that intensive versus extensive systems, which is how it's sometimes presented and how it's sometimes played out. Um, it's certainly in the broader, uh, the broader media when they start to look at agriculture and our impact. And a lot of the actions that I can take around business performance, they also have implications for sustainability, whether it's making more effective use of forage or focusing on animal health. That's going to improve my bottom line and my environmental impact. And I think it's also part of uh, livestock producers in the UK being able to tell a positive story uh, and being able to capitalise on, on certainly positioning ourselves for the, for the long term and for the future. We're in a country where grassland is the predominant type of farmland. Um, I mean, Claire touched on some stats there. I mean, if we're talking about 17 million hectares of farmland in the UK, around about 10 million of it is permanent pasture and rough grazing. Um, so we're talking about um, how we can capitalise on that. So it means building on that natural advantage we've got, whether it's enhancing sward productivity, whether it's including legumes in pasture mixes, whether it's promoting soil health and fertility. They've all got a role. And it's similar as when you, well, when you start to think about production efficiency, so whether it's the health status of herds or flocks, whether it's around age at first calving, whether it's optimizing calving interval or reducing days to slaughter, they're all going to deliver win-wins for individual farm businesses and for UK agriculture. Now, one thing that, Ian, I, I know is important to you at Breeder, uh, and it's also important to me, is around data and measurement. And I think they've got a vital role to play. Um, the bottom line is that livestock producers, I think, have got the potential to measure more stuff. And doing a carbon audit is probably one of the things that already jumped out a little bit in terms of some of the, uh, the fringe sessions so far, and I'm sure it will be discussed more in the, the remainder of the conference. Um, but I think that's one of the options that I think farmers should be considering now and will be doing more of in the future. It's essential to establish a baseline, identify hotspots, monitor changes in carbon. But it's not just about auditing. So I look at something like GrassCheck that CL delivers with several partners, which measures grass growth across 50 farms, forecasts grass growth, and supports more effective grassland management. And effectively, that's all about applying the science to help drive more informed decisions on farm. And I must admit that I'm a big advocate of this, partly because I've been using it to plan grazing on uh, my own livestock farm here in Warwickshire. Claire, I'm not so sure that I'm... Uh, quite up for outwintering uh, just yet, given the, the heavy Warwickshire clay that, uh, uh, that we farm on. Um, but rotational grazing has helped me keep stock out longer than we have for many a year this time around. Um, so I think that's something that uh, certainly has more potential. And that second version of Grass Check is planned to get underway later this year. So a quick plug for uh, for that sponsorship opportunities are still available so uh, please get in touch if you do want to support this groundbreaking work. Now, Ian, I think one of the things that you touched on earlier on, earlier on was around collaboration and if we want to succeed in facing up the challenges I think we need to do more in terms of working together. Um, we have a tendency perhaps to view far neighbouring farmers even our customers as competition. For me our competitors are increasingly going to be from around the world and from other foodstuffs. And we need to shift that perspective. We're part of one supply chain and no one single part of that collective can deliver success. And helping drive that collaboration is a key part of CL's role when it comes to innovation. We're working with members from retailers and processors, from businesses across the feed industry, from uh, leaders in the animal health sector, right through to the technology experts. And that's on top of the scientists. 
The focus is all to make sure that the focus of research and investment is on the issues that the industry faces, and that as far as possible, we can make differences on farm. Now, I think uh, for all the uncertainty and challenges, I think the livestock sector is in for an exciting time, and Phil made the same point. But we can't pretend it's not going to be straightforward. And I think uh, one take out for me that I always get from the Oxford Farming Conference is that there's no shortage of ideas, energy, and innovation within our industry to help us in the future. Thank you very much, Phil. Really appreciate it. Um, we might have time for one quick question before we wrap up. But uh, in terms of, I know your members, you've got both retailers, processors, and, and obviously farmers you're working with. Obviously, big stretch towards uh, environment has been a lot of the conversation. But how do you think that's changed over the last two or three years in terms of their approach to working with farmers? And, and where do you see it going to achieve some of these goals? Um, I think it's it's certainly it, it's certainly a, a shared recognition of a challenge, um, and I think it varies across different types of business in the supply chain to which to what extent uh, they're engaged. Um, I think that we will see more of a, a holistic approach being taken in future. And yeah, talk about Claire was talking about their um, the FAO work that they're doing with McDonald's. Um, you know, I look at some of our retail members, uh, the likes of Morrison's, the likes of Tesco's that, uh, that are proactively engaging and working with farmers to be, uh, to be productive. So yeah, it, it feels to me like it's a big step in the, in the right direction. Um, there, of course, and I kind of get back to data and, and some of those issues there, there's still always that challenge around sharing information and sharing data with somebody who is your customer. And I think that for me feels like a bit of a psychological hurdle for, uh, for the industry still. Yeah, it's an interesting one. We've recently launched a benchmarking product where farmers can anonymously benchmark themselves against other similar farmers to them. And we were worried about that when we first launched it because of the sharing, but actually the positive feedback we've had from farmers who are now getting insights that things like the dairy and chicken industries had for years in terms of where they sit has been incredibly positive. And I think it might be a lot to do with the type of farmers we have who are all very proactive to look for opportunities to improve, but at the same time, I've been very pleasantly uh, excited by, you know, the, the way people have viewed that and, and look to embrace it as it moves forward. So, you know, I, I do think it's very optimistic in terms of where we're moving in the future and, and I think the opportunities are out there. So anyway, thank you very much to everyone. Um, really huge thanks to Claire and Phil and Phil for joining and sharing your thoughts. Uh, thank you to Oxford Farming Conference as always. It's great to be here and I'm sorry not to be seeing everyone in person and catching up with you after this conference because that's always one of the highlights of Oxford Farming Conference, but there's always next year. So we look forward to that and um, yeah, wish everyone a really good 2020, 2022 and look forward to catching up with you all very soon. So thank you very much. <laughs>